I can tell by the plumage that all uh, that red is another adult. Just in case you see one going through your yard, you'll, you'll, you might know what to look for because that long rear tail, which helps them ambush um, small prey, they use that to navigate very tight corners so that they can catch small prey like birds in flight. There's a juvenile for you, so the, 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 the way you can tell this is used to juveniles by that checkerboard kind of on their chest. Um, you can't really go by size much because the, the, they all kind of look around the same size. The, the females in adulthood can be a little larger than the males, but it, that's kind of hard to go by for me anyway. So, anybody know this bird beside her own hand? That's cool. There you go, American Kessel. This is North America's smallest falcon. And uh, I, I would like to say that they're year-round residents, but that, I don't think that's actually true. We just see them a lot. Um, you know, they do stay here for long periods of time, but I don't think they're necessarily a year-round resident. Are these all taken in the lands? Everything you're seeing was all taken in by I'm not, I'm not interested in any other photography from anywhere else. Okay. Yeah, so everything you're seeing is, yeah. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't even include anything that I take in my neighborhood, which is near Bayona. I can just, everything is strictly in the Bayona wetlands. Um, so that's a, a great shot of a, of a pair. You don't see that every day. Um, on the one on the left, I believe that makes her an adult. So these are probably a mated pair. Um, there's one that's mistaken quite a bit because it's a peregrine falcon, but because of its young age, it, can look like other birds, but That's yeah, That's yeah, very merlin. Um, but one of my favorite birds. I, I very rarely mistake them in flight because they have a very distinct wing pattern. They're so powerful that, that you would never mistake one, a merlin for a falcon in flight. Uh, this is a slightly older bird. You can see the, the facial features are getting, you know, kind of filling in. Uh, still probably a young bird though because it's very checkerboard. Um, this is probably an adult, but I don't know if I got a shot of the front to see the difference in the chest area, breast area when they turn. Um, there you go. Huh? May so, I add something? Yes, please. Okay, so, thank you, Frick. Um, you <laughs> notice that black teardrop below the eye, and on your last photo, too, really well shown. Uh, you know, a nickname for the peregrine falcon has been like duck hawk, which means you're hunting over water for your prey which means you have reflection and glare off the water, and so if you have black tear marks coming down, you diffuse that harsh light so you can see the dust easier, or the coop, or the buffle head, or whatever. So it's, it's you know, well designed. Yeah, and if, if you're not familiar with their behavior, um, something Jonathan and I have witnessed many, many times is we think they harass other birds sometimes just for sport. Like, like they, they just seem to terrorize the, the entire violent creek. When, they're, no, when they're, they're doing 40 miles an hour and these birds that they're trying to escape can't be doing more than 15, they, they, they would actually have no chance of escape. But they just dive on these things constantly like as if it's, it's like, like I said, it's almost like hunting for sport. But they only will take when they're hungry. So they might like to terrorize, but they don't actually do any damage. But it's, it's pretty fun to watch. It's a very interesting interaction. You notice that's a non-native tree, invasive and not supposed to be here, right? That's a eucalyptus, right? That's the big eucalyptus. In fact, that is specifically, that's the one that overhangs the bike path in Area C. So maybe you look at a eucalyptus a little differently now as a positive feature on the landscape. <laughs> Thank you for adding that. Like I said, I really wanted to, to not make this about the diversity and, and, and dispel the fact that non-native plants are not necessarily some horrible thing because I have lots and lots of pictures. You'll see several pictures of birds and non-native plants like that. You'll see several shots of birds in, in a bottle rice tree and bottle rice trees are not even from America, let alone from Bayona. So, um, but anyway, uh, just one more interesting note about peregrine falcons. I've seen more peregrine falcons in area C than I have in area A, which is, I find kind of interesting. Now, maybe not not the number of times that I've seen them, but I think the number of birds that I've seen, because there's a couple of birds that hang out on, on what we call the twin towers, or the, the medical towers, that you can see from area A, and I think those birds were seeing the same bird over and over again, but I think when I'm in area C, I mostly see birds in motion, so I think more pair of dogs towards that end, for whatever reason. It's, it, that could be my imagination. Maybe you could like, explain area A and C as 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, biome is basically split up into three major areas, and that and, and those are broken up by north and south of Jefferson Boulevard and the creek. So, basically, if you're on the bike path and you are uh, west of Lincoln Boulevard, um, if you look to the north, you're looking at area A, that big section right there. If you look to the south, over the creek, you're looking at area B. And area C, you would have to go west of Lincoln, over by the ball fields. East. East. Yeah. I'm sorry? East. East. East of Lincoln, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for it. We, you know, I just get my <laughs> All right. So, okay. This is a real test. Jonathan, you have to answer last. You do, right? Anybody know what this bird is? That's because we've only seen one that I know in the past seven years. It's a harlot's hawk. And they're, they're not rare birds, but they're certainly rare for us. And this bird came back. Was it two or three winters, John? How many, how many winters did we see this in winter? Two? two? Yeah. yeah. So this was the first year. And it, it definitely looked a little different when it returned the second year. It definitely matured a little bit. That's just another shot of the same bird making a redirect. Uh, and it's actually going after a northern harrier that was coursing the field. And it was basically saying, hey, this is my spot today. Uh, it's just another shot of it. Yeah, it's, I think they're even in the Buteo family, right? Yeah. yeah. So it is a red tailed hawk, it's just a different uh, coloring form. Yeah. Mid, Midwest, right. What's in this challenge? Okay. So this, this is an osprey. Um, in Florida, we call them fish hawks. I don't know if they, they commonly use that is used here. Um, this one has a Jack smelt in its town. It's a very, very small piece of prey. And although not proven, I firmly believe they're nesting somewhere nearby. Yeah. Because when it caught that little thing, it could probably could have eaten that in a second flat. It flew away with it. Now why would it waste its time flying away with something that small? You know, it could have landed on any person within 20, 30 feet of where it pulled that thing out of the water and eaten that thing in a matter of seconds. So I don't know. No proof there, but again, speculation. You know, no restorations because we have nesting rare birds. <laughs> Sorry, shameless plug. Um, another shot of, of, uh, of I, I want to call this a resident bird because Jonathan and I refer to it as the tan osprey because it's so tan in coloration compared to the other ones that we see. Sometimes we see four, six of them in the area at a time. And uh, this one that's very light in color, very really unique, maybe an older bird. Um, that's the same bird in flight. Uh, the so spray also has that black facial kind of your fish on um, water, seabird, sea hawk. Um, right. So it's also doing that to be able to hunt for fish to be better with the glare. Not like unlike a big small player wearing black marks on your eyes. I've I've actually had people on the um, bike path passing by when taking pictures asking me if it's an, if that's an eagle. Uh -huh. <laughs> well eagle light, right? An eagle's See, hunt for fish, I and mean, it's a it's a fair question. Of any bird in the world. Yeah, they're amazing. They're definitely one of my favorites. Get up there. As well as this one. This is a white tailed kite. I'm going to venture to say it's an adult because of the white crown on its head. The juveniles tend to have a rusty crown on their head and rusty feathers in their breast area, which we can't see on this one. Uh, might be the same bird, not sure. So here's how they got their name. So this is what they call kiting. It's literally standing still in the air, hovering over its prey, because unlike the, the northern harrier, which you know ambushes its prey so quick that it never gets to see it coming, this one gets up so high over it and so directly over it that it can't. Most rodents, primarily these rodents, but it will eat other things. But rodents can't see straight up. They can't see up. So that's what they do. They hover over it. Wait for it to just, you know, be in, in that open spot far enough away from its hole, and that's it, it's over, the game's over. It drives straight down, and, and the, it, the road never sees it coming. So there's a juvenile. Through that, you can see the difference. I do believe, no, no, I was going to say the eyes are redder when they're juveniles, but that's not true. Same? Stay ready, stay red? Okay. All right. 
but the, but the rusty coloration is definitely. Is it banded? I'm sorry? Yeah. Is it the, the left talent? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't think so. It was, a, it was just a weird lighting thing. I, that, that happens to me all the time, actually, thinking that I saw found that banded birds. But then when I actually zoomed in closer on a computer where I have high resolution, it, it, it turned out not to be. I do, we have gotten some banded birds. Um, just in yet another shot. They were just so majestic. I do love these birds. Those red eyes are just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I know I had better shots of red shoulder hawks, but this was the only one I could find. So it was the best I could do. <laughs> but red shoulders are not um, nearly as common as some of the other hawks that we have in the area. So this is just an interesting interaction that the red-tailed hawk on the right has prey. And the Cooper's hawk, I think, is thinking, he's either just angry that the red-tailed hawk is hunting here, or is even thinking about maybe trying to steal the prey. I'm not sure which. They never really got any closer than that, but it was pretty cool to see them both on the same branch. Mm -hmm. But that is the, I, I have these in the reverse, sorry, in the reverse order, I'm so sorry. That was taken before it landed on the branch and the Cooper's hawk showed up. So that's the prey that it eventually landed to eat. And it was a very backlit shot, so I had to really add a lot of highlights to get to be able to see the details and feathers, but that's why it's so washed out. Okay. It's a lot of sun that day. Gopher? Uh, that's like that's gopher, yes. And what I do like about back of the shots so, okay, is they really show why how they got their name and look how red that tail was. You don't necessarily see that all the time unless you get that back of the situation. Alright, so that's probably the rarest bird I've taken at five. If, if not the rarest, it's by it's in the top two or three. This is a called Crested Caracara, and it typically doesn't come north of the, of, of the border of Mexico, although they do, but it's not that common, and it's very uncommon for them to make it up this far, right? Yep. Yeah, and this one made it all the way up to, I think, like San Luis Obispo or something, right? Wow. wow. <laughs> so we were actually tracking it by watching what was going on on, uh, on different uh, listers and stuff like that, people talking about this Crested Caracara, and it came back. But I, I missed it on this, that when I read that, but other people saw it. You were virtually the first person to see it. I was. And everybody came to go. Yeah. You got me to come real fast. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, how do you track these? I'm sorry? How were you able to track it? it there were, so there's, you know, like eBird and things like that. There's other uh, listers like Yahoo groups and things of that nature where people were talking about it online. And so there were, People another who were on board of I'm sorry? Another guy, guy that photographs birds who's on Flickr, and I saw his photo uh, from San Luis Obispo, and I could, I could see that it was the same bird. Right, because it had a, a marking on the feather. It was a very distinct marking. One clip on one feather. So we were able to track that it was the exact same bird. <coughs> bird watchers had to do that all by phone, you know, a few decades ago. Contact, but, and we didn't have cell phones, so we had to go through hotline case, you know, and put it onto a tape of it. But now we have iPhone, yeah. yeah. We can text each other from you know, oh, Jonathan and I are texting each other from like across the field. You know, I'm looking at a you know long range flight and I'm looking at it, you know. So it's like, yeah, we live in definitely a day the, the modern age where things have changed drastically in that communication. <laughs> so arguably this may be the second or it's in the top three of the most rarest birds that I've taken a shot of at by so, um, the Harlem. Harlem. Yeah. Oh, it's like a Fergie. You got it. It's, it's a Ferruginous hawk. You know, again, not a rare bird, but like very rare for us. It was uh, for the one winter that I watched it. I had to spend hours and hours at sunset until at the baseball field, the area C of the Iowa Cutlands, the baseball field area, and it was on the backstop of the baseball field looking for squirrels to hunt. And as it was getting sunset, I was determined I was going to find where that hawk was sleeping at night. And I'm, uh, one, uh, I finally got that one day, evening, then after I got that one time, I saw it repeating this. It went to a Canary Island pine in Villa Marina, where you mm -hmm. live, and uh, slept in the pines. And I would stay till midnight at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, make sure it was staying there, and it did. And I would be up at 5 a.m. before light and still in the time tree on the same branch. And then I would see it leave from the three-story apartment condominium uh, complex with ornamental pine trees and go back into the wilds of Biona and then back again. That's cool. Yeah, that cut down right. Speaking of uh, 5 a.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, I don't think this one needs any 
in the uh, introduction, I think we all realize that's a, that's a great one now. Um, and speaking of spotting things that you didn't see the very first time you take a picture, I didn't notice the very first time I cropped this and looked at it, I didn't notice the, the blood on it, the talons. It, it, I, I probably had a nice meal the night before. This stock was taken during the daytime, but clearly that was still pretty red. Um, and then, how about those talons? See, I wouldn't want that thing to grab me. Um, this, um, this bird had offspring. Oh. <laughs> it's like the next best thing to a kitten right there. <laughs> I'm sorry? Better. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, nobody in this room knows these birds better than Jonathan. I would have gotten you one of the shots that had not been with Jonathan. He brought me there to show me these, so I got some pretty wonderful shots. He knows these birds very well. Very well. Um, this was kind of a rare occurrence, but not a rare bird. We have a lot of barn owls in the area, but this bird, for some reason, for about a week, was hanging out in the daytime. Like, this shot was at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> That's pretty rare for a barn owl. They, were, they, 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 they hunt in pitch black. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, you guys want to see that for just another second? Okay, in the top three, okay, now, now you've seen all of my rarest, rarest birds. This is a shorter owl. You know, again, I don't think a rare bird, but for us, we really get excited. I mean, I think there were, that one night, the first night the report came out, there must have been 15 people out there with, you know, spotting scopes all along Jefferson Boulevard waiting for this thing to come out. So, yeah, I, these pictures are actually not that good. It was pretty dark, so these are kind of grainy and, and not a lot of detail, but... Um, this is a grassland owl. They're born on the ground. The mother incubates her eggs on the ground. They never nest in trees, the opposite of a great horned owl. But it's spectacular. It's yeah. And cameras really can fool you because they tend to turn nighttime into daytime. And then I further enhance that with Photoshop to get some of that detail in their you know, coloration and patterns because the shot was actually much, much darker. They, they hunt like the Harriers, too, and they come out after the Harriers, when the Harriers start going, going to death night, they come out. Yeah. And they have the same yeah, different ships. <laughs> they live in the ground, they hunt the same way. And they're using yeah. habitat that's largely non-native plants, but yeah. it's native uh -huh. animals living in the non-native non mice living in the non-native plants, yeah. mixed in with native plants together. So this is the last shot I have of that bird. And it was the last time I saw this bird. Um, this was fairly early in the evening. It wasn't quite dark yet, as you can tell by the blue sky. And he was being harassed by a bunch of crows. And it flew higher and higher and higher. And I, and I think it left that day. <coughs> All right, so there's one of Jonathan's favorite birds. I know this. One of my favorite birds, too. This is a loggerhead shrike. Um, Photographs are very deceptive, so for those of you that aren't familiar with this bird, it's, it's pretty small. It's like sparrow size. This bird has a nickname, this reason I put this particular shot in here is it's also called a butcher bird, because it's the only bird that kind of lives its life much like a raptor that isn't a raptor. It eats primarily insects and, and other small prey, including other birds, lizards, and things of that nature. And it got its, and that, this shot is, is I think because you can really see that that raptor-like hook that hangs down on that meat that it uses to rip flesh open and, and, and get at the meat. And it got its name because unlike a raptor, its legs and talons are so much like a songbird or any other small bird, it, it can't really grasp live prey with its talons. Like, it can't hold on to it. So it catches things with its beak, and then in order to eat it, it hangs it on a hook like a butcher. Like it'll find a box thorn or, or some other, you know, even a, a barbed wire fence that has to, and it will hang its prey like a butcher and then rip at it with that, with that beak. And so that's how it has its nickname as a butcher bird. First, the lizard has four legs, and an hour later, it has three legs. Oh. Two legs. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the butcher bird, or the shrike in my many Rick, is a song bird. It, it has a beautiful, melodious yes. song. And it has it's really great eyelashes, song. too. If you look carefully, it makes a lot of women jealous of it. Nice, white, long eyelashes. 
Okay, so there's there's a native forest. This is a fence lizard. These are super common. You know, they're cold blooded. They don't, they don't see them a lot this time of year because it's too cold. They're, they're... Yeah, it's so dark. It looks like a, uh, an orcutta. Yeah, it's it, it's really dark right now. They're not always this dark. They tend to be a little bit more like the, their surroundings. You know, they be like any other lizard. They can kind of blend in. But I, I think it was sunbathing because it was a pretty cold morning, so it was made itself dark. I didn't have to attract the sun. So here's another one of our um, common, well, not so common, not as common as intensely, but it is definitely native. This is called a side blotch lizard. And unfortunately, because it has its head turned looking at me, you can't really see the blotch because the blotch is kind of right behind that white spot where the ear is. Um, I don't think I have another good shot showing the blotch, but I do have another good shot. Um, and you can see how different they are from the fence lizard because they have a lot more coloration. And I, I wish I could have found some of my better shots because they have a lot of blue in them sometimes and they, it really does show up in the picture. very striking and blue. It's very pretty. They, they large to lack scales. Well, they lack uh, large scales like the fence mm -hmm. If you were to go back to the dark, mm -hmm. you can see the scales are much larger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. See how it's kind of roughed up yeah. like that the scales. So, so another lizard I wasn't able to find that also called common for us, or somewhat common, is an alligator lizard, but I couldn't find a shot, so I was going to do a project for that. But, um, but while I'm on reptiles, um, this is a California king snake, non-poisonous, for those of you that don't know much about snakes. And these are, I'd say they're somewhat common. You know. Don't you mean venomous? Not venomous, what did I say? Non-poisonous? <laughs> yeah, yeah, poison wouldn't be the correct. If you're, not poisonous, if, you're not poisonous, if you're not poisonous and you're a snake, there's only one other way to kill, and that's to constrict. Yeah. So that's what that does. So, yeah, like, like a kid. Everybody loves, yeah. Well, you're going to love me for that one and hate me for the next one. I'm so sorry, but. They, they're, they're really beautiful, but they are probably the coyote's favorite meal. Or anything else they can catch, but um, but I see them catching rabbits probably more than anything else because that's their you know that's their top prey that they have available to them. I had better shots of this, I couldn't find any, but it's a good one. I mean, it's I, what I like about the shot is it looks very adventurous. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it almost looks like snow, and of course we don't get any of that. But I, maybe you need to leave that in actually. But uh, sea lions do come up by the creek, so they technically are part of our diversity. They don't live in Biome. They come there. Just, um, I don't know. <laughs> Bumblebee? Yes. Uh, I know we get a lot of them. They're beautiful and they're huge. You know, they're like, they're big. There's 12 species of bumblebees in Los Angeles County where we were. We're down to fewer species, and we have two species at Biome at least. Uh, I'm looking over at Jonathan because he's got a cow also. They are solitary bees. They don't nest. They don't nest in beehives, and they nest on the ground. They, she makes a hole into the ground and lays eggs with pollen balls around each leg, each egg. So imagine all these pollen from flowers gathered around her egg, and then she puts it in a tube, like a straw, like tube into the cool soil, and uh, that's and then they feed as a as a larva uh, on that pollen. So someone says, oh, it's just bare ground. Remember oh, this thing. Oh, there's no yeah. such thing as bare ground. Yeah, like, first it's not bare and it's not They go for something big and soil. And the trench logs so, don't, you know, anyway, that's not good. That's not really good. You have a question? Yeah, what, what's the red circular object? In? That's actually pollen that it's collecting. Oh, okay. Yeah. And sometimes it'll be yellow depending on what flowers are in. You know, blooming that and season at that time. All right, so here's um, one that I feel great enough to say is a, a migrant, <laughs> right? Yes. And um, from the desert to the coast. Yeah. And you know, when we talk about non-natives, I mean, the desert not only loves not it lo loves native plants, but it it loves non-natives so much it, it nests almost primarily in palm trees now. There are no native palm trees that I know of. There's one. It likes, it likes a high perch for, for the nest. 
<laughs> I guess so, yeah. I mean, it's just, it must just be good habitat for them to nest in, you know, good it's, the, it's the shag, it's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's an oriole, uh, uh, a hooded oriole. Yeah. It, it's the shag of the palm that it likes. It doesn't nest in a, like an air. Oh, I guess it goes it, it it into, the, goes into those, those hanging dead leaves that the gardeners like to grace away from the land. So when you prove your palm tree, you're going to have to You just saw like four or five pictures of males. Um, the females look like that. So they look very different from the males. You can spot them. <coughs> Another shot, I'm not really quite sure why that shot's so yellow. It might have been more of an effect from the camera than the actual color of the bird. On an orchid tree. Yeah. yeah. So this is an ash-throated flycatcher. This is also a migrant. Um, it's a visitor, doesn't stay all year round. Uh, another shot of an ash-throated flycatcher, just so you can get a couple of angles. I like the way they have a crest. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's a pretty rare bird for us. Um, you can go not far from here and actually see quite a few of these, but they don't, for whatever reason, don't come to Viola a lot. Um, this is a California Thrasher. And it got its name because of that Thrasher-like beak. Um, I actually have a video of, 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 a, of one of them. They have an amazing song. They, I think mockingbirds imitate them a lot because they, they, they sound similar to a mockingbird, but much more vocal and a lot more patterns in there. They're just amazing to listen to. What are the lumps on those branches? Okay. All right. So as I figured, so I, I don't even actually know. Actually, I do know. I'm barely happy with the slides I did. I have to But it, 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 no, it's, it's all good. Um, in fact, maybe what we can do is just kind of leave it running while you guys party. And you can just, I'll just set it on autopilot. Yeah. And so you can, just without the narration or something. But uh, yeah, I don't want to take up the whole night. This is, this is actually a celebration. So let's celebrate my own night, celebrate the wildlife. And uh, who knows, maybe you'll invite me back another day and I'll bring you the other half of that. Bring your birds now. Thank you, Rick. Um, I saw some of the pictures a few days ago. But really, what an awesome presentation. Let's give them another one. <laughs> so I videoed it all, Rick. My wife thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you. So, um, next time in January, I'd like to mention that Roy is back there and he's been doing some commenting. And he's going to be the presenter next time. And uh, I think that that's going to be really exciting too. So, anyway, I'm really glad that everyone showed up. It's a wonderful turnout. Remember, SaveBiana.org, you have a job between the first, before the first of the year. Uh, just go there and get a better education. You'll appreciate all of these presenters more. I understand especially how things fit together. Can you hear me? No. Yes. All right, I want to thank this fine lady and for the sacrifices that her family makes and what she gives to this organization is fantastic. She has remodeled our ability to communicate with each other and with new audience. And uh, so I want to really appreciate that. It's our last chance this year to thank you. And I wanted to make sure we all did that.